welcome. You're tuned into the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Darkness Radio presents Holzer's Ghosts. It is the season two finale of our program. That's true. We're already at the end of season two. And uh, this episode, The Devil in the Rocks, that's the episode we're going to be discussing. Um, I do want to uh, talk about a little controversy surrounding this episode right up front, because many of you uh, on social media were jumping at us and I've seen this episode and you guys are just showing us an episode from season one and blah, 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 blah. Here's the honest to God truth. This episode never aired. This was a season two episode. I think it was one of the very first episodes we filmed this year. Uh, and what happened was when we jumped from travel channel and they put us on mid season hiatus for the holidays, um, they pulled us off the air, but they had accidentally left us logged in for the automatic drop to travel channel uh, go. I think it is and on demand. So this episode dropped for a short period of time, but never aired on travel channel and 90% of the audience did not get to see that episode. So what they wanted to do was when we came back, they just shuffled it into the mix and put it to the end of the season. That is our our season finale for season two. So you weren't hoodwinked. You didn't get cheated. You got to see all 13 episodes. So that explains a little bit about that. Uh, tonight, we've got a, a chock-a-block full uh, show. We've got a lot of cool stuff going on. I, I do have to be open and honest with you. Um, Shane is in a hotel preparing to do his uh, searchers live investigation the power just went down in their hotel. Cindy, who was going to join us, is in a class, and that's running long for them. She might try to pop in if she can, but we've got other great guests that are going to join us on tonight's program, the first of which will actually take over some of the hosting duties with me tonight. You love him. You hear him every week on the Best in Paranormal Talk radio, his first time visiting Holzer's Ghosts. Please help me welcome the one and only Mr. Tim Dennis. Hello, Tim. You hoodwinked me. You showed me this this episode multiple times on Discovery Plus. Yes, no, that's not true. It is funny oh, how angry oh. some people get about this, huh? I mean, um, I didn't have to watch this five or six times on Discovery Plus in a row. No, you didn't. Oh. It's uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So now it's on Discovery Plus. Everybody can watch all the episodes. As a matter of fact, season one and two are now available on Discovery Plus. So you can catch up with the best in paranormal TV programming and, and do it. So for those of you, I'm going to give you a hint right now. For all of you out there that are interested but have not yet committed to Discovery Plus, go take advantage of the seven-day free trial. Download and watch every episode of Holzer Files, all 23 episodes in the next seven days. And if you don't like Discovery Plus after that, feel free to jettison it and never keep up with your subscription. But I'm pretty sure once you see how much is underneath that corporate umbrella of Discovery Plus, you're going to want to stay on and have a little fun with us. So um, please go check it out. I at least want you to jump in the waters, dip your toe into the supernatural swill and become part of uh, the Holzer Files family by watching it on uh, on Discovery Plus. Speaking of the Holzer Files and family, We've got to introduce our first guest. She has a very short window of time to spend with us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the daughter of Hans Holzer. She is a paranormal investigator and researcher and has been kind enough to join us during a few of the episodes here of Holzer's Ghost this season. She is here for the season finale to spend about 10, 15 minutes with us. Alexandra Holzer. Alex, welcome back. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Dave, and thank you for having me. Hi, Tim. Hi. We also have joining us again briefly because he's supposed to be out on the road and we don't know how long the power is going to hold where he is. So we'll bring him on right now. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, because there's not a basement close, close enough for me to send him into, he is uh, stationed somewhere safely in a hotel. Ladies and gentlemen, Shane Pittman. Hey, Shane. Hey, hey guys. How y'all doing? Hi, Shane. <laughs> hey, I'll see you again. We're uh, we're going to be inviting into this talk uh, in a little bit two more great guests who are going to be with us for the remainder of the show. Um, our director of photography, Rob Toth, is going to be with us, and our associate producer, um, Brian Peterson, a Kramer Squatch, as we call him on set, will be joining us as well uh, to share some behind-the-scenes stories and such. Alex, I know you've got a short window here. Season 2 finale, 23 episodes under our belt. Uh, did you have a favorite standout episode this season? And if you don't say America's Stonehenge, I'm going to have to check you into a mental ward somewhere. 
Well, yeah, listen, that's been the rumor about me anyway for the past decade, so whatever. <laughs> uh, obviously, Mystery Hill, and yes, because I was uh, able to participate in it because of what it is. But, you know, I really think for if we could get a season three, we need to go and revisit Mystery Hill and Chain. And I were talking about that earlier because there's just too much there. And if we're really looking at the Holzer files, we're looking at history, right? So right. what did my father do? He went back several times, back to locations, back to the interviews, back to this. Did we miss something? What else can we uncover? Because you can always uncover more. Let's be real. And anything Hans Holder, there's more to uncover. So Mystery Hill was so different and unique because it was outside. And that scared the crap out of me only because when we're like standing there and we're like, we don't hear any crickets. And I said to you, I'm like, well, okay, that means something is like hunting us or something because that's not a good sign. <laughs> Crickets mean they're laying low. Humans, you're now the target. So yeah, yeah, it's yeah, and so incredible to be there. Not it enough was. Time. And I told uh, Dennis Stone, the owner, that as soon as they uncover uh, the spider cavern or serpent well, to let us know because Shane is ready, willing, and able to be lowered into both for a full you know, investigation. You keep volunteering me for stuff that I never <laughs> agreed to, ever. <laughs> Change How dare that. you, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> the show would not be the same without you going into horrible, hateful places. I want to address that, too, because I think this is funny. I honestly believe this, and Alex, you're a sensitive. I think because of who Shane is, I could leave him in the pantry in the house of the, the haunted house. And I could go to the worst place in the house. I think the spirits are going to find Shane because he is open and emotional and raw and very human in those moments. I think the spirits are going to do with him what they want, no matter where I put him in the house. Do you, do you think that's a pretty fair assessment? Yeah. It's almost like putting mistletoe above two people that you want to kiss at some point, something's got to happen. Right. So Shane's like the, the paranormal mistletoe. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> Shane, I want that on your next shirt. I'm the paranormal mistletoe. Look, look, I've already got enough hashtags. I don't need any more hashtags. You guys, you guys, you guys are not doing me any favors here. I started, I, started I up think, now. I honestly think Dave's got 1-800-DIAL-A-DEMON on speed dial on his phone, and he's just I waiting around it. the corner wherever Shane is, and right. he's just... It. He's just it's, waiting to get chained at every location. It's actually a new Holzer Files uh, app that I've got. It's called Beelzebub Hub, and you can uh, order demons to be delivered wherever yeah. you are in the United States. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's It's been a lot of fun this season. The, the, man, even with the, the layoff that we had because of COVID in March and taking three months and then going back out, the year still went by incredibly fast. We got to see a lot of great places. Shane, what was your favorite episode this season? Uh, for this season, I would say Queen Mary, just because, you know, of how the, uh, the pandemic and all of that was, we had a rare opportunity to investigate the entire ship without anybody on board except for a skeleton crew you know uh maintenance workers and things like that um i don't think that would be able to happen be able to happen again on that scale ever again so i mean that was my favorite episode just for that reason and i think the things that we captured uh because the ship was so empty was uh really phenomenal really special I know Tim had some questions he wanted to direct to you guys while he's got you here. So Tim, please feel free. Let me ask, let me ask Shane real quick. Have you been on the queen Mary uh, previous to your experience with Holzer Holzer files? No. Okay. So uh, my, my question, Absolutely I guess not. that was, that was, that was a first time. Okay. Um, because I, I, I'm curious because I have not, I, and obviously I haven't had the opportunity to be on since COVID and, and everything has kind of uh, not been there. I've talked to Dave since to see, to get a sense of a sense of what the the vibe was there. My, my question, and I guess I can throw it to both, both you and Dave is, is, you know, my, the, the one group of spirits, I guess my, my concern would be, would be the POWs that are on board and what the vibe is with them. You, you get the sense with that group of spirits that, you know, obviously they're trapped down there. Um, yeah. And you get this feeling of 
um, internment, you know, um, mm -hmm. but, but is there more of a sense of desperation with that group or did you come across that group while you were there? Uh, yeah. So whenever I was in the rope room, I believe it was on the front of the ship. Mm -hmm. Um, definitely because we were getting responses, uh, like hurt and burned on the obelisk. Right. And I, I really do believe that it, that was coming from, uh, the POWs and you feel a sense of, uh, sadness. Like there was an entrapment there. Like it, it, it's, it's kind of hard to explain unless you're there. It's, it's almost like they were reaching out. It was really sad. It was almost like they're reaching out for help because they were, you know, showing me how they felt at that time. It was just, it was just crazy. I, I really do feel that we did encounter um, the POWs there while we were investigating, for sure. Was it was it an actual active haunting though, or do you just feel it's a residual haunting down in that in that area? Do you feel like they really do sense the time frame that we're in right now, and that they're there really is no one to feed off of uh, well, at this time, time and space? Well, well, that's a very good question. And the reason why I do believe there is some sort of intelligent hunting there is because I felt something grab my ankle. Um, so it was, you know, if it was a residual thing, I wouldn't, I don't think I would have had that experience. Something was there at that time that was coinciding with all of the moments leading up to it with the ovulus, uh, things we were getting on the ovulus that, um, you know, something was there trying to get my attention. Um, I believe that's what it is. Could be wrong, but all of the stuff leading up to it uh, was pretty compelling. You know, Alex, does your dad, uh, do, do you have any sense of, did your father believe that um, intelligent spirits could feed off the energy of residual hauntings, that, that place memory that's going over and over to keep it kind of like a battery for the, the intelligent spirits to be heard and seen? Yeah. Actually, he felt that they were all in their separate little worlds, if you will. So you could have literally the residual hauntings that are kind of going through a pattern of what they once did in life of the physical world. So like, you know, if you have a, a, an environment where there's a home and somebody went into the office, closed the door, and that's what they used to use it for. And then the new family moves in and they use that room for a child's bedroom. And you hear the door closing at a certain time every day, something very specific it's, it's not like a grade A haunting where they're aware of you, you're aware of them. It's residual. It's like an impression. We leave footprints behind. And so we're not kind of there, but our energies were there from X amount of time ago. And it's just a constant loop, if you will, like a Fellini film. It just goes and goes and goes. Um, he felt that everything was kind of subcategoried so that even though you would think, well, if there's a spirit here, there's a spirit there, and they're like 100 years apart, shouldn't they all meet and like have a party? Woo no, that's not the way it works. There's so much going on and so many layers, which is why the Holzer Files is one big para onion, if you will, that smells really good, though, not bad. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it, it's the same thought process and theory. So his beliefs and, and, of course, with the work that I've been doing and my findings are that there's so much more multidimensional happenings going on in one environment that you can't even depict. And it's so when we're dealing with using mediums of different talents and abilities and all of us that have the, the just to feel the environment of what's going on, like what Tim's asking on this huge ship. There's so much going on and there are different layers and levels and, and age groups. And when this happened to that happened, they're not all connected, but they are. So you have to kind of dig deeper into that hole to get to that next level, to that next level, et cetera, et cetera. So he didn't feel that they were all intelligently connected to like, you know, person A versus person B knows that they're both there. They don't. But person C in the middle knows that person A and B are there, but they can't communicate to either because they're they're further ahead in that veil, if you will. But they're able to be in that moment. And so there's a lot of weird things going on. So it's it's like you're kind of digging and digging. And that's why that real research is why you go back and you go back and you go back, which is why I think for season three, we talked about Mystery Hill, return to Mystery Hill is what I think we could do. And then why not back to the Queen Mary? And I think that why wouldn't they give us the ship again? I'm I'm all for it if we get the opportunity. So, but yeah. that but that's part of the holzerisms is what I'm saying. That if you're going to do the holzer work, then you should be able to go back and go back and go back in some locations because they're so layered. And like what Tim's pointing out, it's like there's so many different 
people that had passed at different moments and for different reasons. And so you kind of, and then, you know, people that are going there over the years and years, I mean, who knows? What if somebody brings in an attachment? How do you know that changes the haunting? Right. Can, yeah. can I throw out a question first to Alex and then blossom it out and go to Shane and then to Dave? And I no. want to throw this out as to whether your father would have blossomed this out to, I'm using this word too much. Maybe I was in love with the show Blossom. Um, it, it has to do with residual hauntings. Would it have fallen into his beliefs that maybe a residual haunting wasn't necessarily an imprint or a memory of uh of what would have necessarily happened at that or a scarring of that, that time and place um, such as POWs aboard the queen Mary, but maybe it's really a spiritual groundhog's day that that spirit is real and trapped and it keeps replaying over and over and over again. If you follow what I'm saying, much like those, those German POWs are trapped in that part of the ship on the queen Mary but it keeps playing that sequence over and over and over again. Uh, Alex, can you speak to that first? Let's go to Shane then and then Dave. Do you feel like that would have fit into your father's lexicon of beliefs, or is that not something that would have lined up with what he believed? Oh, absolutely. You know, it, it, which is kind of what a residual haunting is. In essence, you're, you're looping a moment in time over and over, and you're not aware of any presence existing in that space, whether it be of spirit or of physical sense. So right. they're, they're in that moment. But he, he felt that, and I, and I tend to agree with, is that there are those that are trapped. But here's, here's the kicker of it. Okay. And this is where my, my work comes into play. We have free will correct? Mm -hmm. So here's the thing with the afterlife and the different levels and realms that are there. Once we lose our physical self, if we believe and we get trapped, which is what I believe a ghost is versus a spirit, free spirit, hence the term ghost trapped. Um, there are those around that try to come and pull that trapped soul, which is a ghost in my belief out of that environment to move them onto greener pastures, if we will. Right. With that free will, it still does exist. It's not a physical thing. Free will is of the soul, which is of another plane of existence. So this is our physical shell, but it doesn't make us who we are as our vessel. What makes us who we are is us right now in this moment. That's our soul. Our soul does live on. So if the soul that's trapped chooses to remain there after helpers come and say, listen, you need to move on. We need to go over here you can't be here anymore. It's not meant for you. And they don't want to go towards what many have believed over the years and years and centuries towards the light, whatever the light is for that person. Their free will says, no, nope, I'm going to stay right here because I don't understand where I am. I don't want to leave. I'm looking for so-and-so. And, and that creates the entrapment, if you will, that could be mistaken for a residual haunting and then be an intelligent haunting where it crosses over and saying, I see you, you see me. This in this case, this would almost be like almost um, I don't want to use the word Stockholm syndrome because nobody's in love with anything here, but it's right. almost like a group psychosis. Everyone believes they're in the situation for a reason. It's, yeah, exactly. it's no different just because you're not with your yeah. body. Would you think your body right. makes you who we are? No, of course not. Our, our personalities, our personas come from our soul, which we can't define because it's, we're all about the physical, but right. when we use the physical, which is why people grieve and they, they can't let go my, myself included, my father, I know he's here somewhere, mm -hmm. but I can't see him. I can't touch him. Right. So I have this, this blocking of, as a human being, cause I'm of the living still. And I, so you have to kind of go past that level and reach a, a point, a state of consciousness and subconsciousness where you have to say, well, I still do exist. I have to get away from that physical. So my eye color, my body shape, all that's gone once the body dies, but I'm still who I am. And where do I go from there? So either I want to cooperate and understand what happened to me when I died. I want to leave or I don't want to leave because there's going to be guides that are going to come and try to pull you out of there to help you. I mm -hmm. truly believe that. And if you're stubborn in life, you're going to be stubborn somewhere in the afterlife. And so those, the POWs, it's confusing. They don't understand time doesn't exist where they are versus where we are. Time is man-made and you have to be of the physical being to, to understand time. So if there's so many different barriers that you have to cross through and when you've lost your body and you haven't gone to green your pastures, if you will, for whatever is the beliefs of, of what we feel in different religions, if you will, what does that mean? 
And so when you have certain hauntings, does that mean that they're aware or are they not aware? That's, that's kind of, uh, and I'll tell you why I bring up that point. And that does have to tie into this week's episode and, and essentially the end of this week's episode. Shane, uh, can you add to that point or, or the, kind of that theory that I, that I brought up? Shane might be having problems with the uh, video freezing. Yeah, I was, was going to say either that or I just dumbfounded him one or the other. It could uh, be a little bit of both. Ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, that's actually a terrifying concept I hadn't thought of is this spirit trapped in this loop till they figure something out and get it right. That's torture mm-hmm. to me. Yeah. I, I would be, if that yeah. was any of us, we, we want to get on with it. But again, if you're a personality that's very lax, very easy to kind of be like, oh, okay, okay. That persona is going to be in there longer and will accept it longer, even with the help coming if, in if you think about it a lot of these soldiers were following orders so and if you get in the situation where you are um where you're where you're stuck or you're following orders and then you've been captured name rank serial number and that's all you're supposed to give um you're you're stuck in a situation where you're not to give up anything you're stuck you're you're to be given your food your water and you're basically you're talking to your buddies and that's it and it's day after day after day of just looking at the wall and hoping that you can figure out a way to a either get out of there or b eventually be released as a prisoner of war under a Geneva convention. Yeah. There's not a lot of hope. So yeah. it's, you know, it's just day after day after day. Uh, Shane, welcome back. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if I can get your, your perspective on, on that uh, being trapped uh, in, in that uh, residual haunting yet being an active spirit. Do you, do you subscribe to maybe that being a possibility? I I definitely do. And I also believe that Hans would have entertained that idea, just like going off of what Alex was saying. Um, he definitely would. He, he was a very intelligent man um, that always looked at things from uh, an academic perspective first and then entertained uh, these different concepts and ideas in order to, you know, mold his work and further his work. So I absolutely agree with everything Alex said. I think she said it um, perfectly. Very eloquent. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Oh, Alex, yeah. I, I want to make a mention. There were people making comments about your dad's books, how much do they love them. Many of them are going to, to antique shops and uh, secondhand bookstores to try to find your dad's books. You're re-releasing a lot of the books, right? So people can find these books and get new copies. How can they order them and where can they go for that? Thank you, Dave. And thank you all for asking. Yeah. So I've been working with a publisher who's actually putting out my next book. Um, We're trying to get them digitized first and foremost, because it's very economically affordable. And especially now, uh, you know, it's easier to $2.99 to download a book. Um, I like the actual book in my hand. But so um, all they have to do is go to Amazon and type in Hans Holzer. And you'll see the books that have been redone that are no longer in print. So we're bringing back the 60s, 70s, 80s kind of books that he had put out that you can only find in a flea market or secondhand shop. And we're digitizing them. Um, There are some that are in print. Um, There is a best of Dr. Hans Holzer book by Crossroads Press, which is listing everything on Amazon.com. So they can find that one. It's kind of like a tome of his top cases, which I think is a really good find and it's in print. Um, So we're still, we just released the white house ghost. We have speaking of politics, that one came out with the big white house right on the front. I'm like, Oh my God. Okay, here we go. I'm going to promote it anyway. So that's actually a lot of people are are digging that and downloading it. And then we did the British ghost hunt, which just came out. Um, So we, we keep, you know, little by little. And then we do audio versions as well. So, very cool. (laughs) Very cool. And uh, before you guys go, I know both of you are are under time constraints. Let me bring in our two other guests so that they can all say hi. We can be together for a few moments. Ladies and gentlemen, the director of photography for all of the episodes of The Holzer Files, the one and only Rob Toth. Hey, Rob, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. How you doing? Thanks for having me on, Toth. How's it going, buddy? Hey, Shane. How you doing? (laughs) It's good to see you, man. Yeah, good yeah, to have you on here. 
Yeah. And uh, we're you. going to talk with you. We also have our associate producer who was uh, uh, integral to this season's success and being a part of the show, Brian oh. Peterson, joining us as well. Hey, Brian. Hey, buddy. How are you What's doing? Up, buddy? Hey, Shane. Good to see you. Hi, Alex. Hi, Good honey. So we've got we've got the whole uh, clan together here, a nice little chunk. So today, because so many people have asked behind the scenes information, and I thought it'd be fun to kind of talk to a producer who's been on hand with us and helped us, uh, you know, formulate the entire season. And Rob, again, you've been there with us, cameraman Rob, in many of the episodes like tonight uh, or, or this last uh, season finale episode when we were at the ship Chandlery and in the house, you were the cameraman there with me as we were witnessing all the the weird sounds going on around us um we'll we'll get to you guys in a second shane you're working with the searchers you're out and getting ready to do a live ghost hunt soon so what can people do to find you and keep up with what you're doing yeah so you can go to facebook.com forward slash searchers believe and uh we post uh, a lot of videos and a lot of content on there um we're filming something special tonight that should be released uh, in the next uh, upcoming months. So you can check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, all your social media platforms. So excellent. Having a good, t- having a good time doing it. It's been kind of stormy. I'm in a remote part of Alabama. It's been a pretty hectic, stormy day. Well, let's, uh, let's ask you before we let you out of here, season two, season uh, finale here, devil in the rock. What stood out to you most about this episode? Uh, and is there any ba- behind the scenes insights you want to you want to share with the audience before we let you go? Well, a lot of people. One one thing that I want to address, um, I guess, because of my accent and stuff, some people think that I'm saying I died whenever <laughs> whenever I'm we're in the moment. No, I'm saying my God, but it's coming off. I I get really <laughs> southern whenever I'm excited. So you may be hearing one thing, but I'm really saying, oh, my God. And they, they're thinking I'm saying I'm dying or something and somebody's channeling through me. So <laughs> um, and all, <laughs> but it's not. It's just my southern accent. And um, then uh, another thing that stood out to me was when uh, I was in the attic. I mean, we were only showing certain parts of that, but it legitimately it was it was so hard for me to hold the camera up to film what was going on. I know y'all saw a little bit of the shaking, but that didn't even do it justice. It was so difficult to even hold the camera up because it just felt like an overwhelming sense, like something rushed through me. Um, Really crazy moment. Um, And a moment I won't forget for sure. Very cool. Uh, Alexandra, season two finale. Uh, was there anything specifically about this episode or this story that stood out to you? Uh, you know, Cohasset, I know your father um, loved that area. And I, I got to tell you, it's one of my favorite raps uh, of that episode as we're doing the little outro to see your dad walk up and kind of smile that triumphant smile. Um, and it just felt great because it was like, we got it. We got, I think we got the story he was after all those years ago. But what was it like for you to see that and and uh, wrap up for the season? Well, actually, I, I was laughing because I said, thank God he didn't fall in the freaking water because he was so non-athletic. It's not even funny. I mean, he never met a tennis racket that liked him. Do you know what I'm saying? And so we 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 had a lot of places out Long Island by the, the shores and – my my grandmother was, you know, she was living out in Long Island and we used to go and my father was like, not too close to the water. Not too close. I'm like, thinking as a kid, what the hell's wrong with this guy? So um, I, I'm just really glad that I didn't see him fall in. So, Excellent. But, <laughs> Well, and no, with, no. with you, I, you know, I'd love to start revisiting some of these places and Brian Peterson will be able to uh, weigh in on this for us. Your dad has so many files to dig through. I, I'm pretty sure we could do 10 seasons without revisiting any of these locations. Is right. there something, is there one location that we have not visited yet that you would like to see us get into for season three? There's, there's a lot. It's a huge question because there's, there's, there's just a lot. And I, because I'm a New Yorker, so obviously anything that's close to New York, New Jersey, right. Pennsylvania, um, Long Island is huge for me. Um 
I brought up earlier, we talked, you know, Ringwood Manor, but I can say it now safely. So there's a place in New Jersey called Ringwood Manor. I personally went there as a young 20 year old. I know it's hard to imagine I was once 20. I know. However, um, I had an experience there and I didn't even know my father wrote about the place. So, wow. so I go there. Yeah. So I'm an idiot, whatever. I was going to art school too long. <laughs> so um, I show up and um, we were going through the tour and there was no um, air in Ringwood Manor. They didn't have it modernized. So it was hot during the summer. And they have, they're known for their beautiful gardens during the summer. And then during the winter, they, they, they do it up for Christmas, like phenomenal. So we're there when it's hot and everything's roped off with the velvet ropes. And I'm looking into this one room and I had no clue. We just went on a tour. My first husband was from Jersey, was the Jersey thing to do. AOA. So there we go. And I'm peeking in and literally I saw a woman wearing a white gown and her hair was up and she was standing by her window uh, gazing out towards what would have been a, a pond in front of the property, if you will. And then she turns around and looks at me like that. And I'm like, oh, my God, like, what do I do with this? <laughs> Nobody prepared me. For, like, what am I doing here? And so I couldn't tell anybody. And I said, can we just keep moving along, please? And there was no it was so cold. It was so freaking cold. No AC. Nobody else saw what I saw. And then later on, it probably like a decade later, Ringwood Manor was a book that my father wrote, like kind of like Mystery Hill. He dedicated a book to Ringwood Manor in New Jersey. It's another Mystery Hill. And I just was like, oh, my God. So she knew. And I'm like, I hope that my father was nice to her because like, hello. Right. <laughs> you know something? Well, very cool. Now, how can people uh, communicate with you, keep up with what's going on in your world? And if they're interested in getting a reading, what can they do to reach out to you, Alex? Thank you, love. Well, I don't, I mean, I do readings. If somebody finds me, I have alexandraholzer.com. It's been around for, I don't know, eight years now that I've done this website. I, I do it if it's meant to be. If somebody needs to connect with me, then I know that the reading is going to go well, just because I don't solicit it. It's just part of what I know I can do. Um, I've got another book coming out uh, late this spring. It's being edited right now, which is like an editing hell, kind of like development hell. When you're trying to sell a show, you're in development hell. Um, and we're working on some scripted stuff with some people. I have other um, producers and stuff. So it's going to be based off of dad, but actually going to incorporate me, which is, I know really scary, right? Can you imagine? So not at all. <laughs> But yeah, so we've got, we've got stuff moving towards kind of like now is the time. Do you know what I'm saying? Excellent. And we'll see, you know, it's, it's a process as we all know this mm -hmm. business goes up and down, but I love you all and I appreciate you all. And, um, I haven't been a big part of you guys. I mean, Peterson, hello. I know you, <laughs> um, talk, Mystery Hill, baby. <laughs> I haven't had a chance to really, um, get to know you, but I appreciate everybody. This is work nonetheless and i know everybody's worked hard to do it and um i really hope we get a season three i think it's deserving because it's my father and he's put in the work for nearly you know decades and decades and he came way before a lot of people right. in a sense and modernized the field so thank you all very much and um i'll keep praying well thank you alexandra and although this is the season two finale of the Holzer Files, Holzer's Ghosts episode. Uh, we still have five or six episodes to revisit from season one, so I'll continue doing Holzer's Ghosts. We're going to take next week off uh, because I'll be with my uh, bio dad in Florida with him as he's getting his second COVID shot. But we will be back, and I'm sure you'll join me again for um, – uh, more Holzer's ghosts and, and digging into some of the other stories from season one. So thank you, Alex. Thank you, Shane. Shane, be safe out there with the bad weather. All right. Thank you all very much for having me. I appreciate it. Anybody. Thank you, my friend. Take care. Thank you, Alexandra. Always great to catch up with our friends and have them on the show. We've got uh, Brian Peterson, Rob Toth are going to join us. We have to do a quick break. We will come back and get to them, and we'll take questions. If you have questions, put them in chat. We're going to try to keep an eye on it. Uh, Tim Dennis and I here hosting tonight for Holzer's Ghost Season 2 finale. We'll talk a little bit about this episode 
And uh, we're going to get some interesting perspective because Rob Toth, not only the d- director of photography for our show, but also behind the scenes on Dead Files. So we'll talk to him about uh, what it's like to be a cameraman in these closed, uh, creepy places and, and hearing things coming up. We'll talk about that. And Brian will find out what it's like to sift through these files with Gabe and, and uncover these cases that are still available. So we'll do that when we return. Stay tuned. You're listening to the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Darkness Radio. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Cliff Schrader. Uh, you probably all have seen me on the previous videos that I've sent uh, through my dad's webpage here. Uh, my father is Dave Schrader of the Holzer Files and Darkness on the Other Town Radio, uh, and he is helping me to raise money for the Polar Plunge. So I thought I'd just give a quick update. Uh, so far, we're doing great. We're killing it. Uh, we got roughly about three, three and a half weeks left. Uh, April 17th is the day of the plunge, and we're at about $3,000. The goal was ten grand. Uh, and we're just slowly getting there and, you know, really whatever we get is just fantastic. So, uh, I can't be happier. I can't be more proud of you guys. Uh, when you guys donate and you leave such nice little, little tags underneath, I I truly appreciate it. But you guys are the heroes. Uh, you guys are the ones making the huge difference. I just, uh, get to jump in the water and, uh, get cold for a little bit. So it's really you guys who are the, uh, the heroes, but, uh, um, if you're interested in donating, um, you can private message my father and he will send you the link. He's also running a doll auction, I believe, for a haunted, maybe creepy doll uh, that he took on to the Queen Mary for the Holzer Files uh, show. And who doesn't need a creepy doll in their house? Who doesn't need one? Uh, but feel free, bid on it. Uh, I'm sure his yeah, rules are on his webpage. We don't need no creepy dolls in this house. So bid on that and, uh, you know, run that up. It goes till Sunday at midnight, I believe, is the cutoff time. And you might have a chance to get some uh, Holzer Files memorabilia and help out in the uh, same vein, I guess. But uh, don't be coming to me if there's creepy, weird things happening because that doll's in your house, okay? But I appreciate your donation. But, uh, no, thank you all again, and uh, I'll keep you posted as the timeline goes on farther and farther, and we'll get you some video. So thank you so much. Bye. So that's it. Uh, We are doing that uh, auction. It's on my Facebook page. You can go to the Facebook page, scroll down, so you see this charming doll. This is the doll that I used as a trigger object to try to communicate with Jackie. I'm going to be honest with you. uh, It's already up to a $1,000 bid. $1,000 $1,000 for Special Olympics to help raise money. And you'll see her in the um, Dead Calm episode of The Holzer Files. We strapped the uh, the recorder on the leg, left her there to try to communicate with Jackie. So that doll is up and available. Um, I know that she got out of uh, price range for a lot of people quick. So I am also going to drop a second doll. This was also featured in The Holzer Files episode, but she's not as prominent. If you see the scene where I set them on the floor, You'll see the big doll and off to the side, you've got this little beauty. And uh, again, another haunted doll that had been donated to me because people did not want it in their house. I brought it hoping if there were spirits attached to it, they would play with Jackie, the ghost, and we get some activity. But if you're interested in getting this uh, little, little cute doll, uh, I don't know, a little bride or whatever it is, very creepy. Um, I'll have it up on my Facebook page as well, starting tomorrow, Friday, and it'll be available for a few days as well to see if we can raise more money. All the money goes to the Special Olympics to help Special Olympians uh, get their training travel and uniforms we have an exciting show tomorrow we're going to be doing a live video stream just like you're watching right now we have a very special guest terry carnation is going to join us on tomorrow's program terry carnation uh the host of uh dark air radio paranormal legend terry carnation will be joining us to talk all things paranormal we'll do a live video stream uh, here and then the audio will be made available next Wednesday on our regular Darkness Radio podcast. So I hope that you'll check that out. Uh, we're back. Tim Dennis, my co host from uh, Darkness Radio, is uh, here with us. Brian Peterson, our associate producer uh, this season on the Holzer Files. Rob Toth, our director of photography for seasons one and two. Gentlemen, again, thank you for being here tonight. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having us. Thank you. I, 
Peterson, I got to know, um, there are so many cases that you guys have to sift through with Gabe. Um, first of all, just kind of give people an indication. I, I mean, thousands of cases this guy's done. How many cases, uh, locations even still exist? I, you know, I know we run into some are burned down, some are, are gone. What do we run into when trying to book those locations? Most of the locations still exist. I mean, that's that's kind of what I've found. They're hard to track down because, you know, he, he's not giving you the address in the thing. He's not always telling you exactly where it is. So it takes a little bit of detective work to kind of figure out where they are. Um, but most of them exist. I think the, the the tricky part is trying to figure out where they are, who's there now, do they want to have us come in there, and and you know, are they having experiences? Because a lot of times, what Hans did back in the day took care of the problem, and they're not having any problems there. I mean, that was, you know, what we ran into with the uh, the Rockland County thing. We tracked down the very first home they ever went to. It took us forever to find that location, and then they were there, and they were like, yeah, we, you know, we are in t- in in touch with the the spirit world and we feel like whatever he did here in 1952 solved the problem we haven't had any issues here um so that was i mean that's kind of what we've dealt with but there are i mean hundreds thousands of of cases i mean i've heard so many hours and hours hundreds of hours of tapes sandy uh, yep sandy asks how do you decide what cases we're going to focus on when you do start getting yeses from these homeowners or business owners? Um, you know, it, 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 there's a lot that goes into those decisions. Um, what we feel like, you know, the, the, the material we've got from Hans uh, versus what they're experiencing there in the home currently um, versus just the logistics of where they might be and where the other locations are. Um, I mean, there's a whole host of, of things, especially, I mean, this was a special year, you know, with, with COVID happening, we were really trying to just figure out who was comfortable having us in their homes. Honestly, there was a lot of that this year, which is pretty particular just to 2020. Yeah, that, that made it very strange. Uh, Rob, as director of photography, how hard was that adjustment from what, you know, kind of the free reign we've had in the past? And you were filming not only with us, but with dead files, with the constraints of COVID in place. Um, how hard was it to readjust to this new life as a, as a photographer and getting the scenes and being safe? Uh, it, it, at first, it was a challenge. And um, eventually, you know, we settled in and we all got, we all used to, you know, how to, how to do it right. You know? But it was not easy in the beginning. The masks right. were not easy to, to work with. I'll say that. <laughs> no. How many fogged up glasses and screens, uh, right? As we're trying to figure our way through this mess. Well, yeah. when we went down, can... I, Go I ahead, was going to say, do, do you remember when we went down? Because so we got shut down when we were in Maine the first time in Port Clyde, right? And then when we were down for those, you know, five weeks, six weeks before we went back out to Cleveland, we lost half of our locations for the rest, for the, for the back half of the, of the episodes we were going to shoot. So it was a real, it was a real scramble. Like COVID was like taking its toll on the photographers inside the house. I mean, the producers beforehand on you guys. I mean, it was, it was definitely a, a, a wrench in the works. But you guys did a great job of building sound stages that looked like real locations. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's honestly, it's a testament to how many cases he has that we were able to, you know, like, all right, well, you, you know, you guys have old people in your homes and don't want us in there. And you feel like you guys are more susceptible to this. We can find, you know, a case somewhere else with a, a situation that's a little bit better for us. Let me ask you, uh, Peterson, is there, is there a location that you might look at that, that you would think that maybe the network would say, you know what, that's a little too lofty cost wise that maybe there's a, 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 co- you know, a, a case out there that is the creme de la creme of, of one of Hans's cases that, that would be great for TV, but maybe would be too big budget wise for you to tackle. I mean, I would, my mind immediately goes to uh, the international cases, you know, because we've got a whole host. I mean, probably, you know, half of his cases are in Scotland and England and Austria and Germany. I mean, he spoke, you know, a lot of different. He spoke French. Hans spoke German. And, uh, he spoke a lot of languages. So he was able to go around Europe and investigate all over the place. And I've heard interviews with, you know, German farmers and Swiss milkmaids and whatever and pe- Scottish, you know, 
Dukes, you know, like, I, so for me, like the Europe, the European season would be epic, but probably out of the price range. Okay. But we well, tried, we tried. Yeah. Well, we're hoping season three, season four, how can we get season three, season four, watch the show on discovery plus and make sure you keep pummeling the hell out of discovery plus and travel channel with all of your social media posts. Let them know that you want to see another season of the show. Let's talk about the season finale at um, the Bates Ship Chandlery. That was, was that our first episode we filmed this season, Peterson? Yes, and it was cold as oh. it was so cold. Yeah, I th- it's funny because you know uh, people are oh these shows are scripted. We're not scripted, but there there are instances where like we filmed that that interview with the gal outside of the house. And it got so cold that you start talking like this because your mouth is not working. And we had to like warm up and go inside to film some of these bits. That was unbelievably frigid. Toth, I got to ask, how hard is that as a camera guy to keep that camera warm and not fogging up or misting over? You guys are in a lot of places where weather is always changing on us. Oh yeah, all, all all the time. You know, I, I use a lot of those uh, heat warmers. I just I just load my pockets and boots with them, and and I'm good to go. But yeah. <laughs> got to get comfortable. <laughs> yeah, there was it was brutal how cold it was. Um, we'll talk about the experience you and I were having, Toth, when we were hearing things moving around in there. But but Peterson, um, this story kind of stood out, and I know you were excited about it. this. Was your first episode with us? Um, and we hold were on, hearing, Dave, hold on. I was I was a season one. I was working in post as an editor. In no, season but one, I so. mean, out with us in the field, I, sure, being, sure, sure, being active with us out in the field. And I am OG. <laughs> we're right. I, I know you were there for the good, but I mean, this is when we get to interact with you. Yes. Um, that that house, the sh- the ship chandlery. When mm-hmm. we were there, um, there was this moment, and I see what I love is watching uh, the outsiders, you guys coming in to do this. It's it's one thing to be in the the office editing and working through the storyline it's another thing entirely and if you remember what i'm about to talk to you about i was we were getting ready to break and i stepped into the chandlery to warm up for a moment and then i i popped open the door and i'm waving you and and rob safi our director in and do you remember what we were hearing yeah yeah, yeah. well so, i go ahead i mean i i remember go finish what you were going to say because i remember a couple different things in that moment. well we we waved you in and you could hear people walking around and the, there was nobody. Everybody was outside accounted for just the three of us. That was your first in, indoctrination kind of being on set for this. Yeah. I, I just loved your response because your eyes got like saucers and you're like, yeah. get out of here. No, no. What was it like to actually be in that moment then? I mean, you know, you, you, you know, you watch the stuff on tape and you, I mean, I, mm, you don't really know what to expect when you're getting into it. You know what I mean? But then something like that happens there when you're in these houses and you're just like, well, you know, and I'm, I'm in charge of, of making sure people are quiet on set while we're filming interviews. And I remember that you know, there's moments where I'm getting, you know, elbows from the, from, from Safi, from the show he's like, he's like, keep people quiet. I'm like, there is no one moving in this house. Like, I, I don't know what to tell you. Like nobody's moving. There's things are happening here, you know? So that was the first time it definitely like you, you, something was amiss. I, I got to tell you, Tim, one of my favorite uh, parts of filming this season when we were at what, what is it, Mes- uh, Westfield Manor? Is that the name of it? Am I remembering it correctly? Um, no. Where where uh, the girl had committed suicide, uh, allegedly she died of a broken heart, and then uh, Westover. Westover, that's what it was. Yeah. I, yeah. I love the fact that still one of my all-time favorite scenes was when we were getting ready to shoot and you were coming out real quick and you ran between the trees (laughs) oh man spiders Uh, the right so people freaked out by the spiders in season one how different were the spiders in season two when we were at that manor yeah i mean i i've never seen spiders like that i've never seen spider webs like that I mean, it was just, I mean, it was a shriek. I think I shrieked and I had probably an entire spider web wrapped across my face. Oh, you know, it was, we're it was all horrifying. tense. We're all tense getting ready to go in to investigate. <laughs> suddenly, suddenly we just hear, he had run into this giant spider web loaded. They were everywhere. That, that were like the size of a 50 cent piece. 
Dude, Peterson hits like, the ground and he's like he's on fire trying to get this thing off him. Was but it's like Sideshow Bob, like side Bob with the rakes. Like everywhere you turn, there's another big spider web. You know what I mean? Like you yeah. can't, no, there's no getting around it. Uh, so Toth, we're we're in the house uh, uh, during this investigation, and you and I are legitimately hearing these banging noises coming from above us. Shane's up on the very top, hearing the banging coming from all around him. I got to ask you, you are cute, uh, cool as a cucumber during these shots. How do you remain so calm and focused when, when we're starting to lose our shit and you, you just keep, keep on task? How hard is that for you? Well, I have a trick. I just stare at the camera monitor and I focus on that because if I look to the left or the right, I'm, I'm going to lose it, man. I'm really, I, I, so you're essentially pretending you're watching the Holzer files. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm watching it right you're there. Safe. Just from my face. Yeah. And that's it. Cause if I look around, if I look behind me, I'm going to run out of the house. No doubt. I, I, <laughs> I remember in our season one episode, the first episode that aired where we caught the handprint on the window, the, the mm-hmm. thermal handprint. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that one scene when we're standing in that room uh, after Cindy was ready to call out the demon and um shane had been touched in that closet and we all kind of meet you're standing in the hallway filming us and we hear footsteps coming up behind and you've got the camera up and all of a sudden i see your eyes start to just get huge and you look around the camera at us it walked right up behind you do you get used to that or are you just like is every hair on the back of your neck standing up through that entire moment Oh yeah, yeah. I'm I'm terrified, but you know, like I'm watching you guys and I'm watching the monitor, and, and that's that's my that's my safe my safe zone, because I I I I couldn't look back. I didn't I didn't want to see something. Now, Rob, let me ask you this: Before Holzer Files and Dead Files, had you done any shooting of paranormal TV before? No, no. I just did a I did a couple zombie movies. That was it, but nothing really paranormal. So nothing, nothing in reality TV, nothing in paranormal TV before this. Not really. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so literally before something real and paranormal had boom flashed in front of you, you had never had anything flash in front of you before. I did. I did once at a a hotel in downtown Los Angeles. I, I saw something in a mirror in a hallway that I couldn't explain. I saw a person in the mirror. And then when I looked down the hallway, that person wasn't there. What, so in, in real life, what, do, what is your normal response when it comes to fight or flight? Cause I'm, I'm curious as, as to personal from professional, what, how do you, do you normally, when you're professional, are you out of body with stuff? Do you just keep focused and personally, do you flinch or how, how do you, how do you oh, I'm a, things? I'm a big scaredy cat. I'm right. a big security cat. It's yeah, oh, yeah. Anything will set me off. Yeah. <laughs> Lena, one in, of our in listeners. Personal life. Uh, professionally, I, I like you know. You're in the zone. You're okay. in the zone. I give you a lot of credit, Tim. There's no way. I don't. I really don't know how these camera guys do not flip out with all that's going on. Lena asks Rob, "Have you ever been touched or contacted by a spirit during a shoot?" I, you know, I was thinking earlier uh, about um, my past experience on the dead files and yeah, there was, there was a time on the dead files, we were doing a walk um, in a house and I'm pretty sure this was in Missouri and a fire alarm went off in the middle of the walk. No, there was no smoke, just a fire alarm went off. And I, I got like this power, I was standing underneath it and I got like this sensation in my neck and I couldn't, like I was paralyzed for a little bit, you know, and, and then it, we turned it off and it went away. And um, like a few months later, that house burned down. Really? Yeah, I, I was just I just put this together when you when you told me to think of some stories, and I was like, I'm I'm pre- I'm like ninety percent positive it was that house that had burned down like a few months after we were there. Cindy Brown has a question for both of you. How does it feel to be on scene while Dave, Shane, and Cindy investigate such an active location like the Queen Mary? Um, and and you know, we kind of heard a little bit from Rob uh, dealing with the photography end of it, but uh, Peterson, you're on set with us kind of taking notes of things we're discussing so that we can, re- you know, go back to them when it's not scenes where I'm writing, you're doing all the writing and kind of keeping us on task. But what's it like for you in those moments? Do you have to kind of put it out of your mind that this is a paranormal hotspot 
or does it start to affect you and freak you out too? I, I mean, I bury myself in the work of it. You know what I mean? There's so many, especially on a, on a, in a location like the Queen Mary, that's such a huge location. I mean, I don't think until you're there, uh, you, you can ever get a, a real sense of how big that place is. And so for us, it's like, I just have to like kind of cuddle up with the logistics of the location and be like, hey, is this sound going to be okay? And like, just, just keep busy with that aspect of the shoot. Otherwise I get, I get a little tweaked out, especially on the Queen Mary, because that was a really creepy location. I mean, it could, I mean, the fact that nobody was in that ship was, I mean, unreal. It was unreal. Um, but yeah, I, I, I tend to focus on, you know, what's in front of me, you know, the, just the story and, uh, the logistics of making sure everything's, you know, firing on the right cylinder. Well, maybe I can point it to this way, not, not the Queen Mary necessarily, but Rob, first episode, season one, we're at the Whaley house. This is our first investigation together. Uh, yeah. You're, you're there filming, uh, Rob Safi, our, our director is there filming and I get, banged and thrown into Shane and hit the ground. What, what's going through your mind as, as, you know, a a director on this, are you worried about, okay, I got to get up over and get the shot. Or are you worried about, Oh shit, don't let me be next. This is funny because this is capture on camera. So when that, it was like two or three in the morning we were doing, I was so tired. I I actually, I, I had a seat. I was sitting on like the edge of a chair when it happened and and you get pushed i i leap up and i'm like oh my god and then like when it airs i could see myself leaping up in the security camera footage <laughs> <laughs> that, that woke me up i gotta say yeah yeah that was uh that was one of the more awkward moments have you ever peterson have you ever had a paranormal experience yourself either prior to this or uh during the filming yes i mean i had them all season long in these locations i mean it was it was, I mean, you know, I was there when those bells started ringing at the Merchant House Museum. That was, yeah, that was crazy because those bells weren't connected. Like they weren't the, the wires because they need wires to go from the bell to various locations around the house. And they weren't, they weren't wired and they weren't cabled anymore. Um, the Rockland County house, the footsteps in that house, I've never heard anything like that. I mean, there were things that just happened all season long in these locations that have no explanation. And yeah, it really, it, it turned my head more than once for sure. Um, uh, Peterson, were you a, were you a, a paranormal magnet before you got on board with holes or files? No, no, I'd never really done anything in paranormal before. You know, I mean, I was, uh, were, did you even have paranormal experiences? Was it something where it, you were attracted not really. the, the stuff was attracted to you before you even came on board to this? No, not really, not really. But it was, I mean, uh, but I, I love the stories and I love the history of it. I'm a history nerd. So this show especially was, was interesting for me. And, and then once I got on location, it, it very quickly, I mean, it's the, st- the stuff is hap- It's happening, you know, there, you know, like you, it's, there's no explanation for what's happening. Cause you're, I'm, I'm in charge of it not happening. I mean, you know, I'm in charge of keeping things quiet. So when things are, are not quiet, See, I wonder because you are the the gatekeeper. You're the one who's supposed to shut it down. I wonder if that's why it's attracted so strongly to you because you are the one who's supposed to be stopping it. Yeah, maybe. I mean, look, when when we do investigations, I mean, we shut everything down. Like no one, like, and then we get uh, people get bent out of shape about this because we have everybody waiting in minivans like a block away. Like we don't have anybody there you know, because we don't want there to be any sort of noise pollution, light pollution, just honestly, anybody just walking around with a flashlight outside of a window, you know, could be distracting, could, you know, give everybody a false sense of what's happening. And, you know, our producer, like, no, I got to wait in the van. I mean, it's except when it's like 10 degrees outside and they're like, great, I get to wait in a heated van. But, you know, a lot of times they'll get bent out of shape because, you know, they don't want to be in the, in the van for three or four hours, but that's the way we do it. And, uh, you know, because we don't, we don't want any, any distraction. We don't want any, you know, false sense of what's happening. Um, and that's, I think, I think it's cool. And it's telling that that's, that's, that's how we do it. And that's why it's so freaky when stuff does happen, because I'm like radioing in, I'm like, everyone's in the van, right? And they're like, yeah, everyone's in the van. I'm like, well, what? Well, then the person upstairs is not in the van, <laughs> Yeah, you know? Yep. So 
Toth, I'm I'm curious here. Aside from the paranormal angle, a lot of these episodes end up very emotional. Uh, I know at Franklin Castle this year, I felt bad. I tied up a lot of filming um, because I I kept getting emotional during the historian interview. I just started crying uh, and trying to hold it together through that part of it. Um, They didn't show that, thankfully, because I was blubbering like every other scene during the filming of that. But (laughs) are you ever affected by the emotions of the moment as well? When like Shane is getting worked up, uh, feeling violent and you have to film <laughs> and you're near him or Dave's c- crying or, you know, I mean, something like that. What's, what's it like to be on that side of the camera again? Absolutely. Yeah. Like when this is going on, I'm, I'm a hundred percent focused on, on, on you guys. And, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of feeling what you guys are feeling, you know, if, if you, if, if Shane is bugging out and I'm down there with him, I'm bugging out too, you know? Yeah. Remember that time you, you got a uh, bit on the, on the boat in Baltimore? Yes. Yeah. You know, I that's freaked a, out too, man. That, that's a ship. Okay. Let's the USS <laughs> constellation is more than a boat. My friend. Yeah. yeah it's a <laughs> ship. Yeah. I got, I got bit. Were you the cameraman on me when that happened? I was there. Yeah. I, I jumped, I hit my head on the rafters because they were so low. I jumped when, when you, when you jumped, man, that, you know, for those of you that didn't see it, season one, go watch the USS Constellation episode. Um, it, we're following this short, shadowy figure darting around. And then I get kind of distracted by footsteps above me, again, where there's nobody. Cindy's on the level below me. Shane's in literally the bowels of the ship. And we're hearing footsteps. And then I look up and I'm like, God, is that blood? There was like this viscous fluid dripping we found out later it's you know because of the weather and and everything it was probably the varnish from the ship. but as soon as i stopped paying attention to the spirit when that thing latched onto my arm it hurt like a son of a bitch and i've been you know i've got kids so i know what it's like to have a kid bite you and um that oh my god that that hit hard i didn't even notice but that made you jump as well oh yeah oh yeah i almost dropped the camera <laughs> i like that I like that. What uh, what stands out to you about the season finale, uh, Peterson? I mean, you know, we, we got to see a lot of great places, investigate a lot of incredible stories. Um, what stood out to you about this one? About Cohasset? Mm-hmm. Beyond the cold weather? Yes. And the frozen Chipotle we were chiseling out of a bowl? <laughs> Um, that might have been I, the most I, terrifying I, moments we experienced. God, we literally had people walking out of a restaurant, like handing us hot food because we were sitting on the sidewalk. They were like, "Here, you probably need this more than I do." And I was like, yeah, "Yes, I do." Um, that was an interesting experience, uh, just because we had done a lot of obviously a lot of research in in you know going through his files, and there was so much about uh, moving. There was so much about moving the. Chandlery and kind of that story and that aspect of it. And it turned out to be something entirely different um, as far as, you know, the story of Habamak and, you know, the fact that the natives themselves thought that land was cursed um, and, and the story of the, 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 the Brig St. John and the fact that all that and all the tragedy of that land was so tied together. And I guess it's, I don't know. It's really cool for us to go in and kind of with a, like a kind of a keyhole idea of what, you know, Hans thought it was. And then to really go in because he didn't bring a medium to that uh, investigation. He went in and basically spoke to some witnesses. Um, that that whole tape is amazing. I, I, I really wish people got to hear the entire. We only right. put a, a certain piece of it. Listening to like his whole interview with people and especially when he thinks people are full of shit is so much fun to watch him. She's like, thank you very much. and just like shuts him down. Oh, really? Um, Oh yeah, he shuts him down all the time. It's so funny. If you think somebody's like, I see things, and he's like, Thank you very much, just cuts him off. Um, but yeah, just the fact that like the story for us took such a left turn, like when we got there and kind of saw what was on the ground, that was really interesting for me. Um, and I thought it was really cool because it wasn't that I think it wasn't that typical Native American curse story. Is the natives thought that land was cursed and they didn't live there. Um, and I thought that was a really, really, I mean, it kind of blew my mind. Agreed. the The story was was powerful. the The effect that it had on Bob, right? Um, you've got this man who's like a million years old, and I don't mean that disrespectfully, but he was just like he was so old, so set in his ways. But then he just there was no way we were going to get him. We, you guys, like plied him with everything to try to get him to set, and he would yeah. not. He would not come. 
It was funny because I, I, the producer that was working on that specific episode, I said, you're going to get him to set, right? And he said, no. And I said, give me his number. I'll get him to set. I spoke to him for maybe 10 seconds and I was like, he's not coming. He's not. I mean, there's just no way. There was no way he was coming. Well, I know. I, when I, table. As I'm sitting there in front of him and I ask, I said, uh, you know, would you like to come back with us? And he said, no, well, this is pretty much where I plan on dying. And that was it. Mm-hmm. He did not plan on leaving that house. And that's, he thought this was his last winter. And I remember just being hit by that. Um, so much is captured during these episodes. Peterson, help, help out the, the viewers. How, how stressful is it to pare it down from five days of shooting, 12 to 14 hours a day into a 42 to 44 minute episode and having to sacrifice story elements as, as somebody who's creative and an artist by taking those pieces and putting together the story, what is that like for you? It's a lot of fun. I mean, I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, embarrassment of riches, honestly. I mean, it's, I, cause I go into it, especially having worked in post on season one. I mean, I, I go into every shoot knowing that that's kind of, we have that structure of where things need to go. And so I'm just constantly there just kind of thinking about it. And it's, 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 challenging sometimes because there is so much that happens and trying to figure out the stuff that like you know something random will happen that doesn't necessarily tie into the story and it's hard to include moments like that because you know we are on such a kind of tight time frame with the network and making sure the episodes come in at you know 41 minutes and 30 seconds or whatever it is um but yeah i mean i i think it's a it's a great challenge i mean i, I love doing it because it's it's just uh it's it's a lot of fun to think about it like that but man it's there's a lot of material and you'll see, I mean, I mean, you saw in Franklin castle, I mean, there were two full interviews that were amazing that didn't even make it into the show. Right. So I mean, that's where we are like, I mean, cause there are, there'll be people with full on stories that like are holy shit type stories that just don't make it in because it's reaffirming kind of confirming what we already knew. So it's not necessarily new information or just that the investigation was so incredible that we don't want to lose any of the investigation for an interview that maybe doesn't, scratch that itch. So that for me is when we, cause we're never going to sacrifice investigation material, but it's when like we don't get those crazy stories or whatever that, you know, make it in the show. Is there ever a cut that afterwards you look at and you go, man, I wish we would have left this in, or I wish we would have maybe checked that audio a little bit closer. No, no. You always feel good about no. the edit. Hundred percent. I mean, because like, it drives me nuts. There's things in there, and I I've given over to trusting you guys. Yeah. But you know, from the outside, it's like, oh my god. And and I love this when we did Rob. You know, this is something they don't let let happen. They never show the on air people show an episode before it airs. They never let us see it. And in season one, Rob Safi convinced Jim, our our executive producer, to show us an episode, and we were all like what the hell? Why wasn't this there? Why was, and we just beat it up. And, <laughs> and Jim's like, never again, Staffy. This is, we're never doing it again. What but episode? It, was, it was, um, you know, I don't even remember which episode they showed us, uh, but it, it shook Probably us. Willie. It was, it might've been, Willie. I bet it was a lot. I bet it was Lottie in the painting. I, you know, I can't remember, but there was, we, we watched it. We were, you know, it was funny because he gets done and Jim looks at me and he goes, all right, what what didn't you like? And I go, my voice. And he goes, what? And I said, dude, I feel so boring on the show. I feel like I am just Joe Friday. Just the facts, ma'am. So tell me where exactly were you at 2.14 p.m. on Friday, July 17th? Everything feels, and he goes, Dave, but that's not the way it's going to come across. You're matter of fact, you're getting the answers we need. And it was cool. And then when we asked him, he said, you saw the episode what would you have pulled out from that episode to put in the clip you wanted to show? And I'm like, "Ah." he goes, this is all we're allowed. These 42 minutes, what would you have pulled out? And I'm like, I I can't think of anything. And he goes, so trust the process, man. You got to trust the process. And do you think if we get a season three, how about when we get a season three uh, and we're going to be on discovery plus we're not under the same constraints we once were with commercials. Will there be more content? Do you think we might get a 56-minute episode uh, as opposed to 42, 44, or will it always be kind of in that same packaging? It will always be in that same packaging. I mean, I, I worked with the network for a while, so I can mm-hmm. – I mean, they're going to – you. Can, I mean, you know, these shows go to the network. I mean, after they air on D+, 
they then air on Travel Channel or they air on Discovery Channel. And so it doesn't make sense for them to have uh, an asset, a show that they can't just readily kind of dump onto the network. They need to have it fit that that profile. So like the time frame, at least so I can put commercials on. Mark G asks, Dave, do you have any lasting injuries from any of the times you've been attacked? Uh <laughs> I have, I still have a scar on my back from, uh, how is your back? It's it, it. Yeah. I still have a big gash scar on my back from the episode. Um, when, when we were at, uh, the lone maple and, and, uh, Stardust. and such. Yeah. And I went backwards into the bathroom and tore my, my back up. Um, I, although again, camera guys, that, that was a little room we were all crammed in and I was getting oh. so uncomfortable in there. That's why I decided to step out in the hallway. I'm wishing I wouldn't know. Cause that was one of the freakiest moments to see that black shadow figure come flying up the stairs at me. I go ass over tea kettle into the bathroom, split my back open. And I love watching the footage from the, the stationary camera because it's like business as usual for Rob and Rob. You guys are both like, okay, let's get around and make sure we get the shot. And all I remember is I'm laying on the ground like, oh, and I look up and you're right over the top of me with a camera. <laughs> Not like, are you okay? Is there anything we could do for you? It's just like, don't miss the shot. Don't miss the shot. Oh, my God. <laughs> I was outside. I was outside the house, like around the side of the main house, watching the security cams. Um, and I, I had that, you know, there was that one security cam that was looking dead at that staircase. And I had it on the main view. And I was just sitting there watching what was happening, listening to it on the on the, on the the earphones. And all of a sudden, you just flew out of frame. And I just didn't know what had happened to you. And it was like scared that it scared the bejesus out of me, man. I was like, that's why I got up. I was like, what, is he OK? Like, it was it, it was it was that was a scary moment for sure. Well, it's, it's and it had to be the smallest. It had to yeah. be the smallest bathroom too, right? Right. <laughs> and it, is it scary for you, Brian, because you just watched your friend Dave fly backwards, or is it scary for you because you know production can't afford to fix the hole I just made in the wall? <laughs> a little bit of both. We have insurance, so you know. And, uh, I you know. I thought I was going to go through that wall. I hit so hard yeah. when I when yeah. I went backwards in that room. Uh, that was that was creepy as hell. People are like, when are we going to see bloopers? That'd be great. Uh, I, I wish we could show some of the clips. We did admit, I, I admitted, and I don't know if I've ever admitted this to you guys, so I'll, I'll admit it again here. When we were at the house um, where we found the uh, uh, Underground Railroad, the doorway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Peterson knows. I don't know if I ever told you this, Toth, but when, when we were first checking around on the floor, and we went over and found that floorboard that lifted up, and we thought that might be the entrance. And it turned out that's just where they could go to the pipes. Uh, when I went down there, I got down on the floor, and I'm like, this is amazing. And when I stood up, just a little fart. It was just a very tiny fart. But then when Cindy and Jacob over, they're like, oh, something's dying down there. I love the audio from that because I, I have that audio from my recorder and I can hear you guys, you and, and Safi, start laughing hysterically because of everybody's reactions to how bad, bad the smell is. No. <laughs> I've never laughed. I've never laughed so hard. I, I've ne- like I was sitting in the monitors. I was crying, laughing. I, that was <laughs> – because they all, everybody like thought it was might be like paranormal or like something is like because you know you get like cigar smells or whatever it is like we definitely you'll get senses in these houses, but then it's like this paranormal smell and Dave's like in the corner like I don't know what it is. <laughs> she goes it out. smells. She goes it smells like rotting flesh. Something's buried <laughs> down there. She's like I something's couldn't. dead in this house. <laughs> I couldn't have told them from college what it was. All right, oh, <laughs> Tim knows the brew. Uh, so there you go, Toth. I apologize from the bottom of my heart, but that was, uh, that was a, uh, poop a normal activity. <laughs> I know you swore with secrecy, swore with secrecy Dave, but I did tell all the, I told all the editors and story producers to watch that and, and no. Oh, one did you that. really? Oh, oh yeah. Was, that's amazing. hilarious. I was like, you have to watch this and know what's happening. I felt so bad that that occurred. And I had to look at, I'm, I'm fogging yeah. up my glasses. I'm laughing. Sure, so oh, I know I did. I feel like because whoever <laughs> Cindy comes running into it, she's like, well, I can taste it. <laughs> when she said I could taste it, Shane's like, oh, it's everywhere. It's sticking to me. I can't get well, rid then of it. you put Shane right down into it. <laughs> you like shove it down into we, the hole. We might have found the Underground Railroad. I didn't know. Uh, we had to send them down there to look, and I, there was no way I was going to fit cool, through that Dave. hole. This is not cool, Dave. Get Dave. me out of here. It smells like hell. Something's dead down here. 
<laughs> oh, it's been great. Um, great oh, being a part of this. Uh, favorite memories from this season, uh, Peterson? What What would you say is is your favorite episode? Ooh, my favorite episode. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, honestly, I feel like that was a really good episode, the the Waterford House, just because that that everything about that location was just it was it looked like the typical crazy haunted house, and it was in the middle of nowhere. And the archive. This is one of the ones where I wish we could just play the archive for people, just put it online so people could hear the entire investigation that Hans went through, because Ethel was channeling so many spirits and so many voices came through her. And it was it was crazy and terrifying, and and the backstory there was just I mean, crazy. And then to to go in there and have it again take this kind of left turn where you know finding those the underground railroad rooms, um, and and that woman's experience, Mary, and and what she had been dealing with in the house. Um, I don't know. For me, like that was that was really. Uh, uh, I mean, but also then the, the Phantom Hand, the the Cleveland episode, because we've been trying to track down um, Tony Todd uh, and track down that location uh, and tell that story, because that was one of the pieces of audio that we had from season one that I had been, you know, just chomping at the bit to tell that story, just because that audio was so crazy. And that story of the hand coming through the, the trap door was so freaky, you know, so I've been really wanted to get us out there to tell that story. So that was, those are probably my two favorites, I would say. Toth, what do you, uh, what do you say of all the locations we've had a chance to visit in season one and season two? Did you have a favorite place so far? I really like the Tony Todd episode in, uh, in Cleveland at the, the train depot and then tying him in with it. That was, that was great. Uh, that was probably my favorite one. Was there a location that now that you've been there and saw how paranormally active it is, you never want to go back? Um, probably, oh man, um, maybe the Queen Mary, the Queen Mary is terrifying, but when we're there by ourselves, that, that place, oh, yeah. the, the, the bottom of it feels like something in that movie alien or something. That was really right. Scared. I didn't Tim. want to go back to Bob's house, Bob's house in Rockland County. I didn't want to go back to Bob Mazzello's house. Yeah. No, I don't. Very Not bizarre. It. Tim, what about you? Uh, favorite episode from the season? I, I'm partial to the Queen Mary episode, and, and I really did enjoy this past episode. I'll tell you why. Uh, there's um, There was something uh, I I liked, and I, there was something I actually wanted to bring up to Peterson it, it, as an editor. Um, there were a couple of questions, and one question in particular I wanted to ask you about. Did you feel like um, when with uh, – and I don't know how much you kept out of Bob's interview – when you were, when, did you keep anything out of Bob's interview, by the way? No. When, no? Well, yeah, we did because we, we talked to him for an hour when we go to do these interviews. And we have to I mean, anything, out. Pertinent, anything pertinent out of his interview. We, saw, we squeezed all the juice out of that lemon. Did you? Okay. Because it was the first episode we, we shot. So, like, we went back through that with a fine tooth comb. So, we went. Because you know. he was he was really playing poker with you guys. He he yeah. he did not want to give up anything, and you could tell he was the guy who, uh, he was really sitting on secrets. At, at least as a viewer, you could tell he he was not going to tell you anything. No, and that's why I say we didn't leave anything on the table with him because we we he was that way. And the, mm -hmm. the first pass the story producer took with that, I was like, no no no, there's more here. There's more here. And we had to keep going back through it. And so we were combing that footage with a fine tooth comb, trying to get every every piece out of that guy. Um, but yeah, so we squeezed that as hard as we could. As an investigator, I guess, and and I don't know if, if you did this on purpose as an editor or not, um, there was a little clue in there. Uh, and I don't know if, if people picked up on it before even Cindy, Cindy left little clues psychically and little Easter eggs along the way. Um, as to what was going on in the episode. And then there's actually a mechanical clue um, as to what is actually going on in the house. Um, and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll just straight out tell you, I, I know I shouldn't leave a spoiler here because it's, it's still on Discovery Plus. I'll give you the mechanical clue. I won't give you the psychic clue, but I'll give you the mechanical clue as to what is actually going on in the house. And Dave, if you remember, when we investigated First Avenue, 
mm-hmm. and you've got the millimeter, and it has to do with the millimeter. Um, downstairs in the basement, do you remember the little mini transformers that were down there? Right. Yeah. Okay. You remember the leakage that was down there? It was around oh, yeah. 64, 67, something like yep. that. Do you remember what the 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 guy at the club said? What no. that kind of leakage would do to your boys, so to speak? Oh, yeah. That it would fry your boys? Yeah. Um, the fact that whatever walked in front of the millimeter and and gave you a 130 something at twice that amount of RF. That that would have basically yeah. fried all your boys right there. I mean, well, you, you, you'd be walking don't, around. Don't say that too loud. Winnie's going to want me to go stand by that again. We do but, a full sweep. The, we do a full but, sweep, just so you know. So we do but, a baseline to make sure that those there is nothing that's consistently doing that. That's why well, we had no thing, clue what here's happened. The thing. That's a false number. What was, what was given to you on that millimeter was a false number. So what you ran into was not an earthly spirit what ran in front of that millimeter was not an earthly spirit. It wasn't, it was, it was an elemental or it was right. A, a, a Habamak. I hate, I hate to get, yeah, exactly. That's yep. what came up and said hi to you. Yeah, okay. no, we got that. I know Rob, right. Toth, you've got to get going. Yep. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight, buddy, and, and spending some time here with us on Holzer's Ghosts and wrapping up the season. It's been a pleasure catching up with you, man. Stay safe. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, thanks for having me on, and uh, good night, everybody. Good night, buddy. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. It could be the Habamak. It could be that elemental. Uh, it, it definitely, I've never seen the equipment jump like that in my life uh, to watch it respond and react that way. Uh, it, it was, it was, that's why we just all look stunned when we're all looking at each other. And then when I, I you know, I need you to step back, and then it did. And just dropped right. to zero. Yeah. That was insane. Right. And, th- and that's what I'm saying. And if you remember um, down at the, at the Palmer house, there's an elemental in the basement. The elemental in the basement will respond. If you talk to it, if you, if you give it, I don't want to say commands, but if you interact with it, it will interact with you. So that's why I'm saying it wasn't necessarily a demon that it was that you were dealing with up there, but it was an elemental. It doesn't give off that type of RF, but um so you could tell it that there's something unusual or strange that you were dealing with. And so there were little, there were little Easter eggs along the way. And I thought, you know, as we're watching there, there's little clues that were given along the way that you're dealing with something that isn't quite uh, of, of this earth. So I, I thought that was kind of yeah. cool. I guess I'm, I'm tipping my hat to you, Peterson, that it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I didn't know if it was done on purpose, but the, the story that was told along the way, I thought was put together quite nicely on your part um, in the episode. It was a nice it was a nice piece of, of storytelling uh, when you're putting together a program. Well, the Dave, I don't know if you remember that location, I mean, the, the rocks at that location. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, they, they say Cohasset means like the rocky shore or something. But once you're right. there, you're like, holy shit there are a lot of rocks here, you know, and I, my dad right. is a physicist. So I called him up. I was like, what the hell is happening in this place? You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty magical place. And they do a great job of, of sifting through because those interviews sometimes are an hour. Like the Commodore was what three hours. We did that interview with the Commodore mm-hmm. and the queen Mary The guy <laughs> had so much stuff to share with us, but yeah. they, they listen. And then when we're going back and we do the final reveal and ending, then they have to go comb back through there to see if there are any signals, any high signs. And you guys do a great job of tripping those triggers as the episode progresses. Well, I remember, Dave, when we started the Commodore interview, we started like I was very excited that we started that interview a half hour early. And I, like, I, I, it's like Sappy is starting a half hour early. And like as we were running like an hour late, I was like, oh, God, you know. <laughs> uh, Chimp Cavafe asks, uh, Dave and Tim, do you shave each other's heads for your birthday? <laughs> it's a pertinent and important question, Chimp. Uh, no, we allow each other to shave our own. We don't. Uh, we never trust yeah. anybody else with a razor. No. Um, Peterson, this has been a great season. It was a lot of fun to be out there in the field with you uh, to do this, and and I thank you for the time and patience and effort you put in. I know that dealing with us can be a, a handful, three monkeys running in different directions all the time, and you guys do such a great job behind the scenes of making us look good and and making an amazing story. So thank you for the work you do, buddy. It's my pleasure, man. I have a lot of fun on this show. It's, it's a lot of fun. 
And I want to thank, uh, of course, uh, Rob Toth for joining us as well and uh, letting us in on a little bit of the behind the scenes with him. You could check out Holzer Files season one and two on Discovery Plus. All of the episodes are there. Um, I do have a clip I'm going to show in a few moments here for tomorrow's show so you guys can stay and, and check that out. Uh, a quick little insight to what we're going to be doing live tomorrow. Uh, as we leave the audience with Holzer Files uh, Season 2, what 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 would you like to share with the audience that's been supporting the show and showing so much love to it, Brian? I mean, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for caring. Thanks for going on these adventures with us. I mean, this is a really special show. I mean, from the first time we get these audio clips uh, that, I mean, it really feels like you're unlocking a time capsule. You know, these are, you know, a shoebox of tapes that nobody's listened to in 50 years and to kind of listen to them for the first time and, and kind of reconnect with these, with Ethel and with Hans and, and with those stories and to track down then, okay, where are these places? Who are these people? Are they still around? Um, it's a really special adventure that starts with a pair of headphones and ends with you guys, you know, seeing this adventure happen on screen. And it's, uh, it's, it's it, you know, thank you for sharing it with us. You know, I, I can only speak for myself, but I, I enjoy the hell out of this process. It's, you know, it can be a pain in the ass sometimes for sure. Um, but it's it's a really great time. And uh, it's it's a, a unique, uh, it's a unique show. I can say that and a unique experience making it. And uh, I, I hope we get to do season three because we've got a lot of uh, a lot of tapes to go through, my friend. I, I hope so, too. Peterson, stay safe out there. Give our best to your family. And thanks for doing what you do, brother. We appreciate it. Be good. Uh, all right. Take care. Uh, let's show a quick a uh, little um, teaser for tomorrow's live show, Tim. Okay. Again, for people that don't know this, we have a very special guest joining us. Terry Carnation, legendary late night paranormal talk show host, Terry Carnation and the Carnation Nation make it to the Army of Darkness radio. So you're going to want to check that out. Here's just a little clip for you to enjoy. The Unknown. I have proof that aliens live among us. The Supernatural. Have you ever had any kind of experience with haunted objects? The Conspiratorial. Every time a mosquito bites you, it's a new chip that is being implanted into your bloodstream. One man explored it all, became a legend, then disappeared. Now he has returned to host the late night talk show that made him a god incarnate. Okay, listen, I can't do this anymore. I can't keep up the fakey, spooky trailer voice. On April 1st, the world will hear my new show, Dark Air with Terry Carnation. Terry Carnation, a billion listeners. Mr. Carnation, you're going to burn in hell. can't believe I'm in Terry Carnation's apartment. I am the host of Dark Air. I've never heard of it. This is the true story of my triumphant return to host the late-night AM radio call-in show, Dark Air, and the mystery of a caller that may be my dead wife. Harry! Harry, I'm scared. Was my beloved reaching out from beyond the grave? Or was I engulfed in the greatest conspiracy since the hosts of The View were discovered to be robots? I know why you're here, Carnation. You best leave this place. I, Terry Carnation, will be your guide to the paranormal. It's a mistake anyone could make. You thought you had aliens in your mini fridge. Taking calls from concerned citizens. Like my boyfriend is a werewolf. Lord Satan has, has asked for me specifically. He's heard your show and he, he's a hate listener. What is the name of the demon inside of you, Sally? With special guest appearances by certain bizarre individuals. From the office, Angela Kinsey. Happy to be here. You are Jason Reitman. Yeah, can I help you? Hey, Riverside Comic Con, it's me, your old pal, Kevin Smith. I'm internationally beloved actor, Sam Neill. I'm not actually Nathan Fillion. I'm actually an alien symbiote. The radio show, my life, the mystery. You'll hear it all. You'll be breathing in my dark air. This is so cool. Are you saying that chemtrails are actually alien semen? I don't want any of that Terry Carnation stink on that chair. You're jumping me! Rain Wilson is Terry Carnation in Dark Air, dropping April 1st, featuring Yvette Nicole Brown, Al Madrigal, Karin Sony, Tom Lennon, and many, many more. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you dare...
Hey, you know what? I'm starting to like that fakey trailer voice. That's right. You'll be able to see Terry Carnation live tomorrow with Tim and I right here. Same YouTube channel, same Facebook channels. Yes, Tim, you had a question? The hosts of The View are robots? We'll find out more from Terry Carnation and the Carnation Nation tomorrow. Before we leave, Tim, any other last questions you want to uh, throw my way regarding the Holzer files? Hosts of The View are robots? (laughs) I know your fear of AI is starting to to uh, affect you here, but uh, we'll, we'll find out. It only makes sense. I, I call, I think they are the official chat bots. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I guess, um, you know, uh, this last week's episode, I, I, I found incredibly interesting in that there was a lot of, you know, I do have one question. Okay. In, in this, and I, I, I wanted to ask you this about the ending of this mm-hmm. week's episode. And I guess I got to yell a big spoiler alert okay. uh, when when we talk about the end of this episode. And I wanted to tie it into the theory that I brought up at the beginning of this episode. And that had to do with an active residual haunting. Mm-hmm. Um, at the end of this episode, you have the, I, I forgot what you called the the creature, the elemental the ha- creature. Habamak. Easy yep. for you to say. Uh, the creature that uh, exists in the rock that the elemental creature that supposedly as you, as you so eloquently put it in the episode collects souls that keeps them there. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason why I put it this way is, is simply this. I talked about a shared experience and the fact that these souls would have to believe that they're being held by that elemental in order to think that they can't escape. Okay. Mm-hmm. And and I relate it to the POWs that would be on the Queen Mary. Right. That believe that they couldn't potentially pass on. Because mm-hmm. think about how many investigators, how many psychics, even Peter James himself, who was on the Queen Mary for many years, the resident psychic, uh, who told spirits I could pass on and, and go to the other side, yet never did. What held those spirits there? Um, What do you think gives the power, the the elemental, the power to keep this, these spirits in this spot? I think there there is that fear that maybe this elemental triggers, um, like it can trigger in humans, uh, you know, living, breathing humans. Um, It might just trigger that fear amongst the spirits that, they may be afraid to make the next move that leaving that area might um, seal their doom for something much darker. We don't know what kind of threats or what kind of energetic pull, but that's why when I am there and they don't show it on any of the episodes, but I do a ceiling and closing prayer at every location. And I don't just tell them it's okay. You can move on during the prayer. I ask that God opens the floodgates and that all of the friends and family members of these spirits can come forth to help get these spirits back and to wash through these places and clear them, cleanse them and help lost and and, uh, forgotten spirits. And I I don't think they're necessarily forgotten in the way we think as we've been told in the past by many mediums, we still have that free will, but they may have forgotten how to move on or to find that light. And uh, I'm just, you know, I throw out that, that blanket statement, hoping that the light will be open for them. Um, Cindy is not necessarily a firm believer that we can help them cross over. I don't think, um, but that's why, you know, I, it doesn't hurt. I do the prayer because I feel better about it. And I feel like at, at least I'm opening that door and trying. Because the episode, and again, I'm going to throw out the spoiler alert thing here ends abruptly. And it mm-hmm. kind of, it's kind of like, okay, they're all trapped in the rock and we're out of here. See you later. And it doesn't feel like there's closure to it. It just feels like they're going to be trapped with this elemental forever in this rock. And we're moving on. Well, again, a lot of the things that we don't show behind the scenes is that we do reach out to uh, native American tribal members and ask them to do spiritual work, uh, explaining to them what's going on. We do have people that reach out to us after the program to try to help. I, I get that. And it, it's frustrating to us too, because there is a lot of work and time that we spend and effort trying to help But as you and I know, how volatile uh, audience members can be when the thought of uh, religion enters. 
They mm-hmm. want to know all about ghosts and demons, but don't evoke the name of God. It'll piss people off. So right. they don't yeah. they don't show the prayers and a lot of the work that we do. I was really surprised that they showed the Santeria priests in the episode at the Morris Jumel Mansion. I'm glad they did, but yeah. you didn't get to hear what they were saying or doing. You just saw them in the background working and and doing their bit to cleanse. But we have done that. We have had holy people on on um you know Bill Bean, Reverend Bean, and the. Uh, Texas episode um, helped with Lydia and did prayers in her home and over her and did everything he could. So we do try to shuff, shuffle and, and leave it. But in some cases, you know, it's also good television to leave that kind of, there's still something there. And Hans Holzer was a firm believer that sometimes you can go in and remove certain elements of the haunting, but you keep going back because something else may reveal itself. Now that you've removed or help these spirits move on Does something else come to the foreground. And what can we do to deal with that on the next time? So I know Alexandra was saying she'd love to go back to places like the Queen Mary and, um, you know, Mystery Hill, the America Stonehenge. We'd love to get back to some of these locations. But again, we also want to spread out and see some of the other cases because he had so many diverse, weird stories that we want to try to do service to those and then maybe, you know, uh, maybe revisit some of those in a few seasons that we were fan favorites or our favorites to go back and see if there's still something taking place there. So that'll kind of be, um, I hope, the long play on this. But there's only so much you can show. And because, you know, we can go out and say, yes, we christen the entire area with holy water squirt guns. Uh, you know, it's not like it's not a Hollywood movie. You don't see the smoke rise from the rocks as we're pummeling them with holy water there's nothing right. dramatic so there's never really a true sense of closure we just do the best we can with with tr- hoping to help these spirits cross over and and find some peace well and with a what may be a a, a native american or even just a, a an elemental that belonged to the earth long before anything mm-hmm. uh it's not necessarily like you can just go throw holy water around and soon 500 spirits are free um, so I, I, I'll leave you with this question and we'll sure. leave it on this for the, for okay. the program in your mind and in, in your mind alone. And, and this isn't by all means, the be all end all gospel to everything. How do you feel Hans Holzer would have, after finding this out as this logical conclusion that, that you all came to and finding all this information out, had it presented itself in his time in 1964, how do you feel he would have, uh, what uh, the logical conclusion he would have come to uh, at the end of this case, what would he have done to solve this case? I think he would have engaged his trans medium to um, help the spirit or elemental channel through her to try to communicate directly with it and, and see, but, you know, also realizing that he was up against an elemental, there were cases and we've, we've done a couple this season and the USS constellation from season one in a few locations Hans Holzer pulled his medium out because he was worried about them. Uh, okay. The episode that we talked about earlier where we found the um, Underground Railroad, he was not comfortable with a medium in there because he felt that the, the the spirits were screwing with the medium. So there were some cases that he felt, this is a little over my head of, I don't think we can effectively help this situation. Um, he'll He'll document it, tell the story, and then see what could come from it. He would always try to help whatever he could, but if it's something like, an elemental that predates humanity, this, this earthen spirit, he may have tried to talk to it and reason with it, but I don't know that, um, I don't know that he would have felt any true closure, you know, the spirit realm and the, the more eternal realm of these more powerful beings are, are kind of different. And I don't know. And, you know, we'll have to talk to Alexandra about that in a future episode, um, of Holzer's ghost. I don't know how he would deal with true demonic. Uh, I know that he, he knew there were dark forces out there. I don't think he was quick to jump on the fact that, that demons were everywhere. Okay. Um, I just don't think that was a big part of his, his lexicon of, of, of life. It's not, you know, belittling to people that do believe it. I think that's just kind of given the, the um, overall aspect of how he looked at these things. Uh, we are taking next uh, Thursday off. As I said, I'm leaving to Florida to spend a week with my father during um his second COVID shot to make sure that he's okay. His first COVID shot uh, had a, an allergic reaction. So keep them in your thoughts and prayers. My, my bio dad, Bill Clark, um, please keep me in your prayers uh, for a full recovery and healing from this and, and safety. 
uh, and then I'll be back on the 7th of April and we'll kick off another Holzer's ghost on the 9th. I think it is, um, or the eighth, whatever that Thursday is. And we will be back with uh, a look at one of the episodes from season one. I'm also working diligently to get that Amityville Holzer's ghosts special done where we've got some guests that are going to come on and talk about Amityville. If you want to donate to the polar plunge to help special Olympics, we are far from our goal. Uh, even with the donation of a thousand dollars for this doll, we're still about 6,000 shy of our goal. We'd like to at least try to hit that $5,000 mark. If you'd like to make a donation, $5, $10, $20, whatever you can afford, email me, daviddarknessradio.com. I'll send you a link so that you can make that donation. Um, If you'd like, you can bid on this doll. It is still up and for sale. Uh, This is the doll I used on the Queen Mary episode as a trigger object, the haunted doll that was given to me. Uh, Here is the other haunted doll I will be putting up tomorrow. It's much smaller. You can see in size. She's about the size of the head of the other doll, but she's a really beautiful little doll. We used her on the episode. You will see her laying on the floor next to this doll in the episode. Uh, She just, she was much too small to try to strap a, a recorder to her legs and very fragile. So I will put this up. And if you'd like to donate on this, put some bids in. We'll run this for about four days. Highest bid will get this, and then I'll send you the winner clue saying you're you're it. As soon as I see that you've made the donation, we will wrap this little baby up and get her in the mail to you and uh, delivered safely, and you can have a haunted doll in your home and not in my home because I'm tired of having haunted dolls in my home. So uh, thank you all for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed uh, season two of The Holzer Files as much as we did presenting it. Remember to listen to the best in paranormal talk radio every week. Dave and Tim take you into the world of the unusual and supernatural as we delve deep into the stories of ghosts, UFOs, Bigfoot, psychic phenomena, monsters, myths, legends, and more. So stay safe, kids. We'll be back again next week with more of the best in paranormal talk radio. And make sure tomorrow you tune into the same bat channel. And that is at 2 p.m. Central. 1 p.m. Mountain, uh, noon Pacific, and 3 p.m. Eastern to see our uh, our really cool interview with Terry Carnation. Uh, and that'll be tomorrow live right here. The audio will be available next Wednesday on our show um, so that you can hear that and then the full episode of, of Darkness Radio that we will incorporate that in on. So again, for Tim Dennis, I'm Dave Schrader. Thank you for tuning in. You've been listening to the best in paranormal talk radio this is Darkness Radio.